And so if you take your Bibles, please, and turn with me to uh, Exodus chapter 4. Exodus chapter 4. Pastor Mark read from chapter 3 today, and that gave us some idea of our background or what we're looking at here. And what I am doing is I'm going to just uh, share the first part of a, a message that I've been working on uh, dealing with this m marvelous man who is called to the Lord. And what I see as I look at this and I study this man, I see that God uh, in his word oftentimes gives us the idea that these things just happen like this in our lives. And yet when you look at the life of a man like Moses, you see that he is, was at work over a long stretch of time, long period of time. And I was thinking as I was driving the other day uh, how, uh, how I was feeling physically at my age, and yet this man is clearly 10 years older than I am, and he's just at the very beginning of actually being used. There's something about uh, the reality that when God calls you, he doesn't always immediately use you, does he? He actually calls you, and part of the song that Joni sang, the phrase went like this, teach me, teach me to serve you. Teach me to follow. Most of us say, mm -mm, not getting into that prayer, because you know when you offer yourself to the Lord, he is going to use you. Now, perhaps you're here today and you don't know the glorious gospel of Christ. You have never responded to the gospel of Christ. Marvelous uh, uh, events in, in the very life of history where Jesus, God, fully God, became fully man as well. Came to this earth and took upon himself. He learned to surrender that man part of him, that nature that goes against serving and goes against anybody teaching you anything. And yet we saw the Lord Jesus, fully God, leaving voluntarily the glories of who he was in, from the very beginning of time and who he would be all through eternity, and yet coming to this earth and taking on the robes of flesh to become that perfect man, that only perfect man who could offer himself as a sacrifice for my sin. And so I would urge you today, if you don't know Christ or if you know of him and you have been reluctant to give yourself to him, that you open your heart to the ministry of God's Spirit for it is only God's Spirit who will draw you to himself that you might be redeemed. For those of you who know Christ, the example of Moses is a great example for you and for me, and so I'm speaking directly to the church. You may not be a part of this church, but you are part of the body of Christ, the church. And we, as a people, need to be in that position where we can be taught from God. And we need to be in that position where we will say, I will follow. Teach me, O oh Lord, to follow. And that happens all, all through your life as you progressively grow in the word of God and in the likeness of Jesus Christ. Till one day you stand before him. And then you'll know what true maturity is. But until that day, we are learning, aren't we? doesn't matter how old we are or how young we are, we're learning. I want us to uh, look, if you would, with me, uh, to uh, just go back to that third chapter just quickly. And uh, we see, I just want to summarize this as we get into these thoughts of this message. Now, it all has to do with God calling a man, an 80-year-old man. I'll touch upon that in a moment, but here is Moses is in Midian. That's what the scripture says, he's in Midian. He's married a wife, and he is with 
her father in his little kingdom there, and he is a shepherd. This is a man who had known the glories of the Egyptian royal family. He was, so to speak, an adopted grandson of the almighty Pharaoh himself. Can you imagine the grandeur of his life? Now he is sitting in the back woods or the back quarter of the desert. And he has sheep, many sheep that he's tending. This man who is a prince of Egypt, 80 years old, 40 years he lives in that fabulous world, that wonderful world, I guess you'd call it wonderful world, I guess not from the Hebrew slave's perspective, but living among the wealth and the educated, and he was a star. And yet we have now this picture of this man who, after 40 years of that, got into some trouble and fled for his life and ends up tending sheep, probably the lowest spot in society in that day. And here he is, that man, and God comes to him. Do you know what that says to me? If God will do that for that shepherd, that man who was a, uh, a known murderer in the land of Egypt, just think, God will approach somebody like me with all my sin and all that I have to offer him. But this is what I believe God gives us this whole thing all about to teach us that he touches people's lives no matter where you've been, no matter what's gone on in your life. His desire is that you allow him to teach you. And as you follow, you learn to follow even better day by day. Moses is in Midian. Israel, the nation of Israel, is captive. It is uh, enslaved by the, the Egyptians, still going on. Forty years after Moses leaves, those of his family are still in bondage and slavery, misery. And then God comes upon the scene in a very wonderful way and he calls Moses to deliver his people, his people, God's people, Moses' people too. An older man, tending sheep, he is startled by a blazing bush. The Bible says that he is taking his sheep and he notices Maybe in that peripheral vision, he notices this burning bush. He looks at the bush, and it's not being consumed. And so he says, something's up here, and he turns toward it. And God speaks to him, the angel of the Lord from the bush. I believe that was the pre-incarnate Christ. Speaking to this man, a miserable man, an old man, a man who was wondering what was next in his miserable life there in the desert. That bush is not consumed, and God talks to Moses from it. And God calls him. Now, turn over to chapter 4. I want you to understand this. Moses was busy. He was busy about somebody else's business, but he was busy. I want you to understand, God calls you when you're busy. Satan calls you when you're idle, but God calls you when you're busy. You say, I don't have time for this. I don't have time for this. And yet God calls you, and he calls busy people, and it's busy people who give themselves to the work of God, and God blesses. It's an interesting side picture that I have here. But Moses' situation was not a good situation. Things were bad in Israel for his real family. He had what you'd call, I guess, low morale at that point in his life. Things were different 40 years ago. He was somebody in that day. He had political power, but now he was just simply a shepherd. 
And so Moses, as he hears God calling him, is like you and like I am, tending to think the obstacles are too great to be of any really real value to God. But I'll tell you this, God loves to deliver in difficult times and that's what he was doing in this man's life and that's what he was going to do as this man surrendered to him for the whole family of Israel. And so on, the, on a dark, miserable day, he says, go. <laughs> Moses, this backdrop of his life is just bleak. His efforts in the past have been barren. In fact, they've gotten into such trouble, he had left his royal life because he was trying to do something on his own for a people that he thought he loved, cared for, just got him into trouble. The difference is, because we know the future of Moses, don't we? We know the miracles. We know how God used him to be a mighty deliverer. In fact, Moses becomes a type of the Lord Jesus Christ, our mighty deliverer. And then we look back at Moses and we see there's a difference, though, in, in, uh, in Moses 40 years before when he took upon himself to kill this man who was abusing fellow Israelites. And he took it upon himself to do this work. He didn't say, Lord, teach me to serve. He just did it. How often are we like that? We have good intentions and we do it thinking, I'm going to do this because this seems right to me. But I want you to understand the difference is in God's time. It was God's time now. It's God's power available now. And so Moses had better hear, we say. He'd better hear. He doesn't want to stay where he was. God calls us when we're weak. And we can respond to him just like Isaiah in that scripture we read from Isaiah chapter 6. <laughs> he ends up after being cleansed. That beautiful picture of redemption, the atonement at the altar. A picture of Christ and his finished work. And we find him crying out, Woe is me, O Lord. But then in the reality of his, what he would, could use as an excuse. Oh, I can't be used. I've, I have this in my past, or I have <coughs> this, this problem that I'm dealing with right now. He didn't say that. He says, whoa, am I. I'm a man of unclean lips. And then the angel of God del brings that deliverance and that cleansing to him. And now he stands before Almighty God, and he says, here am I. Send me. That's the kind of man or woman God will use today in this culture, in this day. When we recognize as Moses did, and then in, in Isaiah's day, as Isaiah did too, that it has to be God's time and it has to be God's power. It can't be my own. And then verse 4, look at the first five verses there. And Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken under my voice, for they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee, because, look at me, they all, some of my family back in Egypt, they know what took me away from Egypt. All those things are in his mind, and you know what it comes out to be? It comes out to be an excuse why God can't use him. We try to convince God that he can't use us because we're too busy or because to this point in our lives we've been thinking in other ways rather than focusing on the purposes of God. And so we go through the list. And here God calls him out of that burning bush. He, he calls him to be the deliverer of God's people, of his own folk. And it ends up that that's the very purpose for which Moses had been born. Do you realize that? 
when you go way back to Egypt and you see that young mother building that little boat basket that would float and putting her beloved and precious baby in there, trusting that God, her God, would meet that baby's needs. That baby was destined to be used by the Lord. Do you realize that when you were born, Christian, brother or sister, you were destined to serve Almighty God? And the same mighty power that brought this man Moses over these years to that greatness of service. That belongs to you and to me as well. And I'm not saying just claim that, but I tell you what, you need to be in God's word and saying, Father, if you can do it to that man, I know you can do that in my life. It's God's time, it's his power, it's where he wants you to be, where he wants to use you. But he uses excuses here. The Lord said unto him, what is that in thine hand? And he said, a rod. In other words, a stick. And then he goes through this whole series of showing Moses that he is that powerful God that he says he is. I'll tell you something, folks. We have God's word that tells us that very thing. Do you believe it? Do you live upon the word of God? Or are you worried about your aching bones and your lack of finances and maybe your lack of education? What he said to Moses, he says to us, teach me to serve. Teach me to serve. So Moses' fears of rejection and his fears of failure just begin to infect his mind. Have you ever been there? <laughs> yes. And all that limits you. And in your idleness of thought, Satan enters in like a lion who would devour. And he draws and conjures a picture of yourself to yourself that may be very real and in some sense true. But he is talking to a child of God who needs to be busy about the Lord's business. And Moses gives that as an excuse, I think, in, in his own thinking toward God. He talks about, oh, I can't speak very well. You know, I, they're not going to believe me. I've, I, I remember my past, my sin. I, I committed murder, Lord. You don't want to use somebody like me. But then... The Lord turns it all around. He says, what's in your hand, Moses? What is in your hand? Oh, Lord, I, I don't have anything. I don't have my wallet. I don't have my wealth. I, I, I just have this old stick that I use when I'm defending my sheep. Just a stick. And what we see is that God desires to take what was there simply in Moses' hand and bring the miraculous through this. Now, Moses was always aware that that was just a stick. And yet he recognized, too, that as he surrendered that stick to the Lord, the Lord would use him and God's power would be in him. God would get those things done that needed to be done for his glory and his honor. Maybe we're remembering our past failures. Maybe we're coming up with all kinds of excuses that we are just too busy. I'm too busy to express to a neighbor the love of Christ, the need, the need for a Savior. Maybe I'm too busy. Maybe I'm too busy 
this very week to cut out and give God whatever spare moments I have. God turns Moses from the fear of the future, tomorrow's fears, and he brings him to the realities of today. What's in your hand, Moses? Throw it down and see. I am God. I am the Lord. It's easy for us to dwell on tomorrow's difficulties or the situations that may arise and get our focus complete. Oh, what will happen? What if the Great Depression moves in again? Will I live to see my children grow up? Will I be able to pay my bills? And so God turns him from all of that, I'll call it junk, that gets in the way. And I realize that's a horrendous thing to say in many ways, but in reality, from a spiritual standpoint, God can do anything but fail. And so God turns Moses to this question that he can answer right now. He says, what's in your hand, Moses? And there's no excuse for not answering this question. We need to face the questions that you can answer today, right now. To follow the Lord. To walk with Him. To serve Him. Beyond anything else that's going on in life or anything that we may be frightened of for the future. God knew the answer, didn't He? Even before He asked Moses. Moses could think of nothing of value, and yet God would use that stick for his honor and glory, and it would be well known all down through the ages of mankind. In fact, Moses later on in the 16th chapter of this very book, in 14th chapter, verse 16, he takes that rod, and in the name of the Lord God, he opens the red sea. God present in his life. Teach me to serve. Teach me to surrender my life more and more every day. And then in the 17th chapter, he brings water from the rock. So just simply give what you have right now at your disposal. Surrender it to the Lord God. And I'm here to tell you, He will use it. Jesus asked me that. What's at your hand? What's in your hand? What do you have to surrender to Christ right now? You know that God will do much more with what he has given you and what you have in your hand than you possibly can. There's so much more to this, and I want to continue. I'm not going to belabor it now. But I want you just to be aware of this, that God says to you right now, what do you have in your hand? What do you have? You give what you have to the Lord. You say, I don't have much. Give it to the Lord. He'll use it. I think sometimes we're afraid to give what we have, what little we have to the Lord because he will take it and he will maybe make us walk in a different way than we choose. Will you surrender all that you have to Christ today? For those of you who don't know Christ as your Savior, the Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Trust 
the finished work of the cross of Calvary. But believing friend, what do you have in your hand that you may surrender to him right now? I don't even want to know because some of you don't want me to know. But I know in my own heart and life as I search my life, it brings me down to the very basic man that I am. God will use your talent. He will use the gifts he's given you in the first place. You see, he is sovereign Lord, and when you came into this world, O oh Christian, he had a plan for you for every day of your life. But he calls upon us to surrender what we have that he may use. For that's the way he's chosen to reach this world. What's in your hand? We live in a world of enslaved, hurting people. Moses understood that in a little bit different perspective than we do. But you know very well, you look anywhere out beyond your own eyes and you see nothing but hurting people in despair, people who are taking up all kinds of calls in their lives, trying to do something to, to, to bring that satisfaction or that happiness or that joy, and it will not come. It will not come. Only Jesus, who spoke from the burning bush and called a man like Moses, called him to be a deliverer. He's calling upon you, O oh Christian, to be a deliverer, to live simply for his glory and his honor. Will you do it? Will you do it? Will you be a servant in your heart? Let's pray, shall we? Our Father, we pray that you would just open our hearts. Oh, Father, maybe not to some of the foolishness that comes tumbling out of this man's mouth, but, oh, Father, to your very word. And may we go from this place with a sense, oh, Lord, that you have called us to serve you that life has more meaning than just simply making the buck and getting the family through and working on education and doing whatever we do. But he calls upon us to be his hands in this generation. O oh, Father, use us, we pray. Teach us, O oh, Father, teach us to surrender. That's something we have to learn. Teach us, O oh Lord, to serve. We have to learn it. But, O oh Father, here we are, right here. O oh God, do that work in our lives, that purifying work as if we were with Isaiah and that seraphim took from the altar, God's altar, of cleansing and atonement, the very fire. Oh, Lord, we thank you for the Lord Jesus today. We thank you for the forgiveness of sins that we may bring those needs to you and say, Lord, I don't have any excuse now. I'm, I'm forgiven. Now I want to be busy for you. Thank you, Father, and we'll be careful to give you praise, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.